Okay. Hello, folks. Good afternoon. I am not David Wilkins, but I am the executive director of the Center of Legal Profession. I beg uh, David's pardon today. He could not be with us, our faculty director. So I'm subbing for him by way of introducing our guest speaker today. And I'm actually excited to hear uh, uh, our speaker today because it's near and dear to my heart as someone who's practiced law and uses and has used this tool. Uh, we're joined today by Ann McDougall, who's the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of LexisNexis, which is a tool I would assume many of you have already used, and if you have not used, you will be using, and it will be part of your lexicon of your vocabulary for the rest of your legal life, uh, possibly, depending on what happens in the future, right? <laughs> Uh, Mr. McDougall joined LexisNexis in 2004 as Vice President and Legal Director for LexisNexis International, where he oversaw the legal function for the group including regulatory compliance, commercial agreements, IT, intellectual property, and litigation. Before, before joining LexisNexis, uh, Ian led legal HR facilities departments at Telco Global LTD Limited, previously one of the largest UK independent telecom providers. Come on in. Ian sits on the United Nations Rule of Law Steering Committee and is a member of the UN General uh, Advisory Board. So we welcome Ian and we look forward to hearing your talk today. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so I am uh, really pleased to, I'm going to try and fit in a lot in the short time that we have today. This is a big subject. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, the subject of the rule of law to you. And I say introduce. Um, because I am always surprised um, that the rule of law as a subject is taught in so few places. Um, I, my little campaign and the reason why I'm here today is to try and uh, go some way to changing that. I think the law is one of the most fantastic, wondrous achievements of human civilization. And when you think about it for a moment, to follow a purely philosophical concept by which everyone's lives can be governed, which is based on reason, in the logical sense of that word, which is based on reasonableness, in the utilitarian sense of that word, and a broad-based consent, in any sense of that word you like. I think it's truly amazing. And when we discuss the law, and you can lift your head just for a moment above the details of this piece of legislation, or that court judgment, and so on, you, you can remember, or I ask you to remember, as you leave today, that we're discussing a subject that, as I'm going to show you during this talk, delivers peace, prosperity, and social advancement wherever it's strongly felt. And also, before I start on the topic, I just want to briefly make a comment on the notion of justice as distinct from the rule of law. That, justice, um, is an, it's an entire course of study uh, on its own. I can't possibly cover that as well in a talk like this. There are so many um, aspects to the notion um, of justice. Um, in the 1600s, um, political philosophers um, like Thomas Hobbes argued about the theory of natural justice and law in Leviathan. In the 1800s, utilitarian thinkers like John Stuart Mill um, argued that justice was the best outcome for the greatest number of people. And that sort of implicitly accepts that not everybody gets justice from time to time. And we certainly know that's true in the real world. Um, we wouldn't have things like pardons if we didn't um, accept that. Philosopher John Rawls used the social contract argument as the foundation of justice. Property rights theorists, Robert Nozick, for example, argue property rights-based justice maximizes the wealth of an economic system, and so on. I'm not going to go into any of those points today. But with that build-up and the caveats, let me see if I can take you uh, through my uh, agenda for today. I'm going to talk about the origins of the rule of law as a topic in its own right. I'm going to talk about what we mean by the rule of law. In fact, I'm going to be even more specific than that. I'm going to talk about what I mean by the rule of law. I'm going to define it. And then I want to talk about related issues such as the economic impact of the rule of law. And that's important because apart from thinking that this is a morally good thing to do, I want to show you the economic necessity of the rule of law. I'm going to show you that it directly impacts people's pockets. Now, it is, it's, lazy to, it's easy to be lazy in thought. And when I first started this kind of uh, talking um, tour uh, that, I, that I'm doing, uh, which eventually I'm 
proud to say, became the joint project with the United Nations that you briefly heard mention of, I made a number of assumptions. They were wrong, but, but I made them. First, I assumed everyone would know immediately what I was talking about when I said the term rule of law. Now, that was my first error. The second was that if I travelled to different countries around the world, then lawyers everywhere would think I was talking about the same thing. And that's also proven to be wrong. So the subject of the rule of law isn't as well understood um, as it ought to be. And if you look at different legal systems around the world, the expression the rule of law means many different things. I remember in one um, talk I was giving, one member of the audience scratched their head and says, but it's obvious, we've got laws, what, what's the problem? So I'm going to answer all of those points, first by going through the agenda uh, that I've just listed, and also by emphasising a point which I'll come to later, which is the difference between the rule of law and rule by law. So let's talk about the origins of the rule of law, and they go far back into history. The Code of Hammurabi was promulgated by the King of Babylon around about 1760 BC. It's one of the first examples of the codification um, of law, presented to the public and applying to the acts of the ruler as well. That's an important point which I'm going to come back to a number of times later. In the Arab world, a rich tradition of Islamic law scholarship embraced the notion of supremacy of law. Think about it in this way. Um, Islamic law requires that it be enforced and followed by everyone, including the ruler, in exactly the same way. And this is an important element, which I've said I'll be returning to. Core principles of holding government authority to account and placing the wishes of the populace before the rulers. Uh, they can be found in moral and philosophical traditions across the Asian continent, including Confucianism. In one of Plato's books, called Laws, it was his last book, he says this, and I'll quote him. He says, where the law is subject to some other authority and has none of its own, the collapse of the state is not far off. But if law is the master of the government and the government is its slave, then the situation is full of promise. End of quote. So we end up with a situation where arbitrary power leads to unfairness, injustice and abuse. And another point, just as an aside, it's worth making at this stage, is that it's not only the execution of the power and the nature of the execution of power that is the cause of problems. It's also the unwillingness of those in power to relinquish it. Recently, for example, the president of Rwanda amended the Rwandan constitution to enable him to stay in power until something like 2036. Now, there is no doubt that a long, the longer a particular person or a party remains in power, the higher the prospects of corruption become. One of the main barriers to corruption is the possibility that the people you're bribing won't be in power for very much longer. So there's a little point in continuing to bribe them. In India, the concept of the rule of law can be traced back to the Upanishad series of writings. Now that provides, quote, that the law is the king of kings. It's more powerful and higher than kings, and there is nothing higher than the law. And for those of you who don't know, Upanishad is a considerable body of Hindu thought. And then we move to the UK, uh, where we find one of the first known constitutional-style documents called Magna Carta, 801 years ago. Now, Magna Carta, as many of you may already know, was um, uh, the first known document imposed upon a king by a group of his subjects, the feudal barons or the early aristocracy, in an attempt to limit his powers by law and protect their rights. He was forced to accept that he was not the source of ultimate power and authority. Magna Carta established the rule that no free man, which in those days meant a landowner, could be punished except through and subject to the process of the law. An example of that uh, document's influence around the world includes, for example, the due process clause in the US Constitution. Okay, so that's a little run around the world. The reason why I'm uh, running around the world in that way is just to emphasize the point that the rule of law as a concept is a global concept. It is not one part of the world, or as I like to say, the West, telling the rest how to behave. This is an important um, element of what we're talking about. But now let me turn to the definition of uh, the rule of law. So, 
There are many definitions of the rule of law. What you're looking at there is a United Nations um, definition, which, if I may say so, is hideous. Um, the uh, United Nations, it, the rule of law appeared in the preamble to the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Then two subsequent reports, 2002 and 2004, discuss the point. They talk about things like an independent judiciary, independent human rights institutions, uh, defined and elected powers of government and fair and open elections. I'll return to the subject of democracy a bit later, by the way. Um, and the second report focuses on quality of legislation, supremacy of law, equality before the law, and many, many um, others. And then there is a 2005 resolution of the UN Human Rights Commission, which focuses on separation of power, supremacy of the law, and e equal protection. It's all a mess. And so what I've tried to do is to strip this down to some very simple concepts. Having looked at many of the definitions around the world, including that one, and seeing a very important need to make the message as simple and as easy to communicate as possible, I think we can talk about the rule of law in the context of four very simple principles. These four principles principles can incorporate many subheadings, of course, uh, s but I think that the four points I'm going to talk about now can be thought of as encompassing um, the rule of law. So here is my very, very simple definition of the rule of law. It basically starts from the point that everyone is equal under the law. Now, you may have picked up that concept a moment ago when I laboured very heavily um, the fact that uh, uh, people like kings and others were subject to and not above the law. Basically, it means that the law is applied to everybody in the same way, no matter who you are. Now, you men I mentioned before about having subheadings. Well, you could talk about equality and other things under that subheading, but you don't need to for reasons that I'll come back to later. But it's only a part of it. To have a system where the rule of law functions effectively, a number of additional things um, are required. The law should be properly published and accessible. And what I mean by that is that without knowing what the law is, you can't enforce it. And without knowing what the law is, you can't demand its protection. And without knowing what the law is, you can't really have a fair shot at complying with it. The next point is that it should be administered by an impartial judiciary. That means judges who have no interest in which side wins as long as it's according to the law and according to equality before the law. They judges have nothing personally to gain by the outcome and they're not compelled as a result of any external pressure by any outside party to come to any particular decision. A subset of this might be the fight against corruption or political interference. It is fascinating, for example, to consider the question uh, in the light of news reports as to the extent of the impartiality and independence of US Supreme Court judges. I'm pretty sure that if the process of parading them in front of legislatures in order to assess what their political opinions were before appointing them to a position as a judge, if that was happening in other countries around the world, I wonder what would be said about the impartiality and independence of the judiciary. The final element I'm going to draw your attention to is remedy. The, law, the rule of law must provide for reasonable access to reasonable remedy. And that, again, is simple logic. Hopefully, I've stripped these principles down um, to such a point where they become almost unarguable. If you don't have a remedy for your grievance, the law can be ignored. If there are no consequences to ignoring the law, then you don't really have a law at all. And this means even having a remedy against the government or other people, whoever they may be. Again, back to our equality under the law provision. Now, people can and they do use different words to describe what they mean by the rule of law. But I think what you can do is to strip it down roughly to those four points that I've, I've just uh, mentioned. By the way, I, I will try, if I can get through all this, to leave some space at the end for a Q&A, um, because I do want to be uh, provocative, if I can. And let me address a couple of points, therefore, that I've left out of my definition of the rule of law. One is the expression human rights, and the other is the expression democracy. So first, 
let me explain why they don't appear in my definition. And by the way, you remember I started by saying this is about not having the West telling the rest how to behave. It's an important concept that makes the rule of law a universal concept. But anyway, let me tell you about why human rights isn't in the definition. In part, I think it's implicit in the establishment of the rule that everyone is treated the same under the law. But I also think that human rights is a fascinating subject all on its own, and it would take up a whole lecture series if, if, uh, if we had the time. But I want to explain some particular problems. Maybe there is a small element of human rights that can be universally agreed. Um, the right not to be killed. Um, the right not to be imprisoned without fair trial, and the due process point I mentioned earlier. The right not to have your property seized without process of law, although I don't think communists would agree to that. Um, but what about other things? Abortion? The right to a home? What about the right to education? Is the right to education a human right? Well, if so, then human rights are things that develop and change like the wind through time. They're not absolutes. If you had asked someone in the 1500s whether the right to education was a human right, they would probably have laughed in your face. But now? Well, will the right to access to the internet become a human right in the future? Now, uh, President Obama some time ago said something that came perilously close to that when he talked about net neutrality. Anyway, I'll move on. Let me turn to the second of my controversial exclusions, democracy. I'm, not, I'm going to be controversial here and suggest that democracy is not a crucial or a necessary element for the rule of law. In Plato's Republic, for example, he imagines a system of government where enlightened people rule for the benefit of all and there isn't any need for democracy. So I ask you, is it possible to imagine, for example, a hereditary ruler or some kind of unelected sole ruler who rules in accordance with the rule of law? the principles that I've put up there. I think it is possible to imagine such a thing. And in fact, if we looked at the Code of Hammurabi, we came very close to actually seeing one, or admittedly in ancient times. Now, it may be that democracy is the only modern practical guarantee of the rule of law, but you can certainly imagine the contrary. So, I'm going to f uh, follow a rule of philosophy known as Occam's Razor, and I'm going to uh, strike anything that isn't strictly necessary to support the proposition, and therefore democracy is not a strictly necessary element of the rule of law. And I'm happy to discuss that at a later stage if you like. Now, I'm not arguing that democracy is a bad thing. That's a different point um, altogether. I'm just making maybe the academic point that it's not strictly necessary for uh, the rule of law. And I'm going to quote from a paper called Corruption, Good Governance and Economic Growth by two writers, Verhoeven and Jaeger in 2003, who said, and I'll quote them, democratization and political stability are clearly not enough to allow for development. Therefore, democracy as such does not represent a guarantee for the development of a particular society, as is shown by some of the Latin American countries and will probably be shown by some or most of the Central and East European countries. In other words, just simply converting a society to democracy without having the fundamental elements of the rule of law will make no difference at all to its advancement. And from this, something else becomes apparent, and I'm going to restate this again. In my discussions on the rule of law, I am specifically making no comments on political structures or systems of government or societies. What I'm proposing here are universal principles that can be applied in any circumstance that will advance um, the rule of law. And in our business uh, for the rule of law uh, project uh, with the United Nations, we've taken a very deliberate and conscious decision that we must not be telling people how to govern themselves. Sometimes, as I said before, uh, people say to me, because my country's got laws. We don't need to worry about this. You're talking like my country doesn't have laws. And that misses the point, which leads to the difference between rule by law and the rule of law. And I hope to provide you with a very, very simple um, axiomatic answer to that as well. In circumstances where you have laws, you have a starting point, the rule by law. You have laws. But unless you have the four criteria that I've outlined then you don't have the rule of law.
In other words, if you take one of those four categories away, you can still have laws and you have rule by law. But the rule of law is founded by having those four um, axiomatic uh, points. Again, trying to simplify the message and make it as universal as possible. So, oh, there's another justification um, uh, for this approach, by the way, the uh, universi universality approach. Uh, and that's, if you remember a few minutes ago, I was talking about concepts of the rule of law through history. And I showed you that the concept is not a Western concept. And therefore, making it a truly global concept is bringing it back to um, its origins. And uh, when we do that, we can clearly define what we mean by the rule of law around the world. OK, now I'm going to talk about uh, the economics of the rule of law. Why am I doing this? Uh, this is a law uh, class, not an economics class. But what I want to do is to show that the rule of law is not an academic subject. It has a direct correlation uh, between people's lives and the success of a country. I'm proposing that there are three reasons why uh, the rule of law is crucial. Crucial to our understanding of the subject of law and crucial to the advancement of people everywhere. The first reason is one I've spent a long time talking about, and that's it's a logically sound and fair basis upon which to run a society. In other words, it's the right thing to do. The second reason is a foundational reason. The rule of law is the foundation of all other rights. There are many activities designed to promote general well-being, anti-human trafficking policies, there are environment policies, there are anti-corruption policies, and increasingly commercial organisations such as my own have significant corporate social responsibility programmes for a whole variety of reasons that could take up another lecture. But my point is that without the elements of the rule of law that I've outlined, all those activities, policies, goodwill, intentions are just pieces of paper. They don't have any real effect. The point is, you can't actually achieve anything in all of those other areas without the foundation of the rule of law in place. Or, OK, if that overstates it, then uh, progress is at least delayed or obstructed without the rule of law. No rule of law, no contract system. No rule of law, no land law process. No rule of law, no protection against personal injury. No rule of law, no environmental protection. And no rule of law, no criminal justice system worthy of the name. And so on and so on. But the third reason is the one I'm now going to turn to, and that's the economic argument. And I'm not talking about the economics of laws, um, which is an entirely different subject. Again, I'm talking about the economic effect of the rule of law. Now, Douglas North person over there, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1993, wrote about the importance of the rule of law in his book, which is called Institutions, Institutional Change and Economic Performance. And he wrote that a major consequence of the absence of the rule of law is the inability of societies to develop low-cost, effective institutions that are able to reduce transaction costs. And that causes economic stagnation. Um, by the way, you'll note the point that I've just made. No rule of law, no effective institutions to advance social uh, development. There's a great example, which I'll refer to again later, but it seems appropriate to refer to now, uh, of uh, the Arab Spring, for example, which many of you uh, may be familiar with, the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, etc., etc. Now, again, do not make the mistake that that was an uprising in favour of the uh, democracy. It was not. I can tell you, having been to uh, many of those places, uh, the people concerned um, honestly have very little interest in democracy at all. It is not a concept they're familiar with or understand or even think is remotely important. The concept was about access to systems which enable them to have a business which enables them to live and feed their families. If you take an example in some of the countries around North Africa... In order to have a business, you have to have a business license. You might have to have a company registration. Uh, you might have to have a premises license. Uh, you might have to have a specific trading license. And in many countries, all of those things vastly exceed the amount of total income that any small business owner will ever own. So, what do they do? 
they start trading without those licenses, which leaves them open to corruption and which excludes them from access to remedy, from equality of treatment under the law, etc., etc. And in fact, the, um, uh, a great documentary on that, which I will mention, which is well worth looking at. Anyway, economists Daniel Kaufman and Art Gray, they're up there too, uh, wrote a paper called Growth Without Governance, published by the World Bank Institute. And they showed that there is a 300% dividend. And that means that over the medium term, a country's per capita um, income rises by about 300% more if its governance is improved by only one standard deviation point, which is defined in their paper. But what I'm trying to say is that moving the needle very slightly in the rule of law creates great benefits. There's a logical um, assessment to consider as well. Where the instability of a legal system reaches higher endemic levels, investment can't take place because the investment can't be protected. Low investment results in low economic growth. I'll put it another way. If you can't get your contract enforced, why do you bother to contract? If you can't get your investment protected, why do you invest? The chances are that you don't. And when I say this, when I connect the rule of law to economic growth and prosperity, a thought occurs to many people. You can see I've done this talk a lot, and including questions already uh, taken in. If the rule of law is so good for the economy, then why is one of, if not the fastest growing economy in the world, China, growing so fast? It doesn't have the rule of law by any um, measure that we want to give. So why does economic growth soar in places lacking governance or the rule of law? So, I'm going to answer that simply as I can. It's a complicated answer, but the answer can be explained by a number of ways. First, it's the fundamental law of macroeconomics. Uh, it's called the law of diminishing return, uh, for example, or catch-up effects. Basically, think about it in this way. Your country has a very low per capita GDP. Let's imagine it's, for argument's sake, $1 per year per person is the uh, country's income. If you increase that by $1 your growth rate is 100%, but you still only have $2. So the growth rates are not actually a real measure. The country's national GDP growth is not a true measure. What we do at Lexis is we measure it, uh, we look at per capita GDP. And I'll show you some examples in just a minute that illustrate the point. So if we take China as an example, you've got over 1 billion people in China all with a very, very low per capita GDP, which means that you don't have to increase their GDP number per capita by very much to have an extraordinary level of growth. But even the Chinese authorities have now accepted that their previous growth rates are unattainable, even if you believe the numbers that they produce, which, again, is open to debate. China's developing a larger middle class. <coughs> can't be economically exploited in the ways of the past. So the Chinese elite currently seeking to square that circle and how do they maintain power at the same time as improving the rule of law for economic reasons. Now we may be about to see before our very eyes the largest experiment, social reform experiment in history and the test of whether my thesis is correct about whether it is possible to have the rule of law in the absence of a genuine democracy. I think we're going to see that played out in front of our very eyes in China on the biggest scale imaginable. And I'm further supported in this by an excellent paper called China as a Test Case, Is the Rule of Law Essential for Economic Growth? It's by uh, Professor Dam, uh, who is a professor at, uh, or at least was, University of Chicago uh, Law School. And he says, and I'll quote him, the fact that the Chinese leaders and thinkers have expressed an interest in Douglas North and his work suggests that they know that their institutions are not sufficiently strong for indefinite sustained growth. And if that wasn't enough proof of the connection between the rule of law and economic prosperity, then let me show you a couple of graphs that we at LexisNexis have uh, put together. Um, the first graph plots countries per capita GDP along the um, Y and across the um, horizontal, we have their rule of law score. I'm standing in the way 
um, of that, sorry. Um, basically, that information comes from um, the World Bank in respect of per capita GDP, and it comes from the World Justice Project in respect of a rule of law index score, which they spend a long time putting together uh, using hundreds of thousands of uh, data points. Now let me show you some other graphs, because it isn't just um, GDP uh, that, it, that it affects. Let me show you some other socioeconomic measures. Oh, well, let me just go back, by the way, and first of all point out something to you, which is, here is China, there is the United States. So even though you have a low um, uh, overall GDP uh, growth, the fact is that when you actually strip out for size, you get a true measure of a country's um, uh, rule of law and prosperity growth. Down at the bottom there, you can see the usual suspects, um, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Pakistan, all countries where the rule of law, I think, is generally accepted not to be very strong. And you can see what it does with their um, GDP. Um, and up there, I think, pretty much the usual subs suspects with regard to, uh, uh, to that. Let's have a look again at some other measures. This is a child mortality uh, rate and rule of law. Maybe not so closely aligned. It's still statistically significant. Um, and corruption index, which comes from an organisation called Transparency International. So you can see uh, that when you put the evidence together, there is a significant correlation uh, between them. But I was recently asked... Uh, at another presentation, a classic chicken and egg question. Does the rule of law lead per capita GDP, GDP growth or does GDP growth lead uh, the rule of law? I've got a simple answer to that too, taken from a recent survey of the business community conducted by the law firm Hogan Lovells. That survey showed uh, the top three investment concerns and they asked, I think about a thousand, but I can't remember now, uh, CEOs of companies, what were their top investment concerns? The survey showed right up there in the top three is the thing that prevents investment in a country is the lack of the rule of law. And you remember I said some time ago, if you can't get your investment protected, why invest? Well, the answer is simple. Companies don't invest. In other words, companies don't invest in an environment in the blind and hopeful expectation that their investment will be safe. They tend to invest in places where they believe their investment will be safe. That means they invest in places where the rule of law is strongest and, in place, and avoid places where it's weakest. So, with that backing, let me again emphasise the high level of correlation between the rule of law, socio-economic measures that lead to a strong and prosperous society. I'd like to spend a brief amount of time talking about one further point regarding proper institutions. I mentioned it a moment ago. Let me come back to it. Um, as I said before, in order to exercise rights over property and therefore to be able to invest to, ingrow, uh, to grow a business, many government institutions are required, and I listed some of them earlier. If you don't have access to those government institutions, you don't have access to legitimise your business, you're excluded from the rule of law. Corruption holds back economic development massively. You've seen a moment ago a uh, direct correlation between the rule of law and corruption we see the additional influence of perceived corruption on economic growth. And there's another report from the UN called the Human Development Report 2003. Again, that shows that absolutely clearly. Um, the, um, the thing I was talking about with regard to the Arab Spring, there's a fantastic documentary which is called um, Unlikely Heroes of the Arab Spring by a man called Hernando de Soto. Um, and he talks about um, this, the exclusion and the real causes of the Arab Spring, which had nothing to do with democracy, as I mentioned, and uh, is, is very, uh, very interesting. So there you go. That's a, a basic conclusion. I wanted to just very briefly talk before I uh, finish on why this is important to the legal profession in particular. There are, um, we are living through a time at the moment where we are going through an amazing uh, conflation of different things which are putting enormous pressure on the legal profession. For example, the world of corporate social responsibility used to be something that people thought of as being very nice to have add-ons um, to part of a company and people would do it and it's a bit of a, bit of a side uh, thing. But 
increasingly around the world, laws are being passed which not only require companies to do CSR, but require them to report on them, and sometimes require them to invest a minimum amount of their profits. In the UK, um, a, a new legal entity has been established under the Companies Act, for example, um, which allows for social entrepreneurship. In other words, uh, doing something, contributing something good to society, and allowing you to make profit while you're doing it. And something else is happening as well in the legal industry. Computers are coming along. A lot of the things that lawyers used to be able to pay for are starting to be done by computers. Eventually, and it may be well after I've gone, but eventually computers and artificial intelligence will be able to remember far more law than you ever will. So the question is, what is the lawyer going to do to add value as part of their career? How are they going to add value in the chain that leads a customer to want to come to them and feel safe and having someone contribute to their best interests? It won't be just remembering the law. That's not a skill that is going to be important in the, years, um, in the years to come because AI will be able to do that for you. I'm suggesting to you something like corporate social responsibility, being able to show how you can help not only society but your clients make a difference um, with, for example, the rule of law in the world is going to become um, increasingly um, important. So there's a, um, a sort of coming together like a perfect storm, if you like, which does in fact lead to the need to be directly involved as a legal profession with corporate social responsibility. The idea that I'm not the conscience of my uh, client, I'm just there to give legal advice, that is becoming some, a thing of the past because being a conscience of your client is actually also overlapping with your obligations to give them good legal advice as well, increasingly. So, I just wanted to briefly uh, mention that point without diverting the main uh, talk on why this is an important subject. But what I've tried to show you today is, you'll be relieved to know, I'm finishing my comments now, I've, I've tried to sum up all of the, I'll try to sum up all of my points in a very simple kind of bullet point way because that's, that's the way I think message gets across. I've tried to show you that the rule of law is a long and international history dating far back. It's not the preserve of one part of the world. I hope I've illustrated what we mean by the expression the rule of law or at least what I think a synthesis of the many different um, explanations of the rule of law is. I hope I've given you something to think about. My points on human rights and democracy. Uh, I've shown you the difference between a rule of law and rule by law, or the difference that I believe um, exists. Um, and finally, I show, hope to have shown you compelling reasons why the rule of law is probably one of the most important legal philosophical concepts, but also it's important in a real practical sense. You can make a difference to people's lives if you macro advance the rule of law around the world. It's a fundamental platform on which all other legal notions depend for their success, if you like. It's the right thing to do in an academic or moral way, but it's also an imperative for economic um, development. In a report by uh, Gary Hogan and Victor Boutros in 2010 called And Justice for All, they quoted an earlier UN report which estimated that some 4 billion people around the world still live outside the protection of the rule of law. Now that's an awful lot of economic potential being held back as well as rights being abused um, and people not having access to justice. By advancing the rule of law as a subject, by becoming familiar with it, by actually advancing its cause, in a non-political and non-judgmental way, we can make a tremendous difference in the world. So when you see news reports of government at home taking some kind of arbitrary action or trying to exclude the courts from decisions or people from access to justice, remember that it isn't just a problem for those people involved. It's a problem that becomes an economic problem for us all. And when you see governments taking action contrary to the rule of law, simply for short-term convenience, and I'm now thinking of things like detention without trial for an unlimited period at Guantanamo Bay, then you see a slippery slope to tyranny. Could be you next. You should be on your guard 
to stop us going down that slope. And I want to leave you with a quote from an old English case from the Second World War where a um, dissenting judge uh, called Lord Atkins spoke words that real, really uh, speak to me and speak through the ages. The case concerned uh, the, the right of a minister during the desperate times of the Second World War uh, to hold someone in detention simply because he thought they might be dangerous for an unlimited period of time and without bringing them to a trial. It's not like anything that happens in the world is novel anymore, is it? Um, Lord Atkin said, amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace. It's always been one of the pillars of freedom, one of the principles of liberty, that the judges are no respecters of persons and stand between the subject and any attempted at encroachment on his liberty by the executive, alert to see that any coercive action is justified by law. I wish I'd thought of those words. Thank, thank you very much. If I haven't bashed anyone into submission, you're very welcome to ask any questions if you like. Don't, don't feel obliged, but I'm welcome to. I'm happy to take them if you like. I'll take a crack at the first one. Okay. <laughs> if you go back to your four principles, yeah. is there an underlying assumption, though? I mean, you, you say you don't need a democracy to have a rule of law. Yeah. But then are you also saying that we don't need an educated society to have a rule of law? That we could have a, an idiot lead a, a, a society, a demagogue or a buffoon? Yes. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Yes, I am saying exactly that if you follow the principles that I've laid you down. Still have rule of law. Yes. Yep. Even without okay. Yes, because once you uh, go into further detail, which is beyond the principles of the rule of law, then you're talking about things like whether this particular law is a good idea or whether this particular action is a good idea. Yeah? That's not the rule of law. Yeah? That's a system of governance. That uh, um, uh, individual decisions, etc. What I'm talking about here is the rule of law. Following the rule of law based on those principles, yes, it's possible to have laws that you wouldn't agree with. But if they're applied equally, that they're visible, and that everybody is treated equally under them, that the judiciary imp uh, imposes them, and you have access to remedy when you're ill-treated, that is the rule of law, yeah. So, is that, so those charts you put up, or the, 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 the x-axis was... Yeah. That's made by the World Justice Project. Do yeah. They take into account, are they having the same definition of rule of law as you have? Uh, they have, yes. Different? Yes, they do, yes. On the uh, World Justice Project uh, website, they have a four point definition of the rule of law, um, which is roughly the same as mine. I mean, so they're not taking into account their assessment of the you know, in their index. No, it's focused around the elements of the rule of law as I've described. I was actually very pleased to see recently that the World Justice Project um, had up on their website the four, four points of the rule of law, which I was very pleased about. One other follow-up question then. So does your, do, do your four points assume that the society that is governed or ruled by the rule of law understands no, they don't need to understand that particular concept as long as they follow them. So, for example, in the United States, we've experienced a rash of violence. And we've had so-called leaders suggest that we need law and order, as if, for some bizarre reason, violence doesn't happen. And we have people who are prosecuted, they are arrested, and they are charged, and due process takes place, and there are trials, and there are judges. But for whatever reason, they think that the rule of law window by virtue of the simple act of disobedience or violence. Isn't that a complete misunderstanding or lack of understanding what the rule of law is? Yeah. Yes, it is. And the simplest possible answer is yes. Um, but the other thing that I would say as well is that you'll notice when I put up uh, the score there um, that the United States scores at number 19 uh, in the rule of law. Um, index. And there are a number of reasons for that. The uh, judiciary point I mentioned earlier, the access to justice point um, which I mentioned earlier, large numbers of people who simply can't afford um, to get access to justice. There are a number of reasons why the score isn't up where Norway and Sweden is, um, for example, but 
That, well, that, that's true. So, for example, let's imagine country X, yeah, where people uh, believe that the rule of law is very strong and therefore um, outside investment starts coming into that country. What will happen is that um, their, um, their beliefs will be confronted by reality if that's not the case. So you may have an initial spike. And indeed, some countries around the world, for example, will have a change of government where the government says that they're committed to stamping out corruption and everything's going to be great from the time I come to power. And you do see an overseas investment spike um, in, in many of those countries. But then reality takes over. And if reality doesn't actually match perception, then what happens is those investments fail um, people don't get what they're expecting, and you f see the, um, the number go back to where it was before. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I guess just a follow-up, and this isn't to challenge what you said, but just out of curiosity. Um, I don't mind you challenging, by the way. Well, it's okay. I don't, I don't know what else. <laughs> are there cases where um, overseas investment, I guess, is targeted in such a way that the rule of law is in reality weak, but that weakness caters to investors. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, for example, if we look at a country um, like the United Arab Emirates, for example, or Saudi Arabia, by many measures, those countries are not considered to be very strong with regard to the rule of law. Yeah. But when you look at their uh, GDP per capita, they're absolutely off, off the scale. Yeah. Well, primarily this is because, of course, they sit on most of the world's oil supply. And so there are going to be kind of anomalies that, that come out of this. Um, but what I would say to you is strip out oil wealth um, from that country and then see what happened. Um, uh, you know, th as I say, there are some freaks uh, that happen because there are some quirks, of, you know, global quirks that happen, which of course... And th so there are going to be some outlier countries, as you saw. But basically what I'm saying is that if you follow the curve you basically get the correlation. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that will happen based on various different things. For example, a small country um, might have a particular uh, project with regard to a massive pipeline that just runs through it. So it hasn't changed any of its structures at all, but there's a big investment for a particular project which distorts the numbers. Again, you take those distortions out by effectively looking at the curve. So what is your guess on China? So if they get rule of law, but upgrade their rule of law, but uh, remain uh, a more closed political system, they're going to zoom up that the, the, the curve? Well, I... Uh, I mean, this, we're into the world of speculation, but um, I do think that for a while that will work. Yeah? So um, for the foreseeable future... Yeah, they will start to, and I don't know if you noticed, but the, but the president has actually um, instigated a massive anti-corruption drive um, as well. So, you know, if you were to hold a referendum, he'd probably be quite popular at the moment and win an election. But leaving that aside, um, for a while, they will work in that way. They will try to square the circle of how do you maintain power whilst at the same time having a better, more effective rule of law. In fact, something that China did uh, quite recently was to uh, publish its latest five-year plan. And the five-year plan uh, was minus some um, words, um, which are very important, but which very small things in China can sometimes mean very, very big impacts. In the previous five-year plans, they had a statement which th was that the judiciary was subject to the will of the Communist Party. Yeah? In the latest five-year plan, that statement didn't exist. Yeah? Um, now, just those few words might mean a significant transformation in the way that the judiciary views itself, or at least the start of the way uh, that it views itself. Your position, you're just putting your GC hat on. One of the things we actually just heard was that the Chinese uh, regulator of SOEs, Tim Sasson, uh, put a regulation out that they can do these sorts of things that basically said the, G the GCs of SOEs are required now to be considered senior management and to have basically uh, control over corruption uh, functions. I can assure you they're not the only company to put GC's hats in the ring. 
um, when it comes to uh, liability. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, around the world, uh, governments are starting to uh, take that attitude. And in fact, um, a lot of recent um, regulatory um, activity, um, certainly since the 2007 um, financial crisis when uh, regulators became far more active um, uh, in regulating their industries. I personally think that was because they were after protecting their budgets. But be that as it may, they did become much more active in the world and the level of personal liability in respect of uh, mem senior members of organisations is going through the roof in respect of a whole range of things. Yeah. Which consists of judges yep. who do not care which way cases come out. That seems to conflict with what many legal theorists have been saying about the interpretive process, which is that judges have to make normative decisions whenever they, you know, interpret anything. Mm. And they've got even further to say that they should make those normative calculations, like for example, a pre-commitment to advancing minority rights. If the judge wants to roll the dice, so to speak, to get an outcomes that achieve certain normative moral pre-commitments, that, that is generally a good thing for the legal system. So very much about that. Yeah, so um, let me start by what I said, which was that judges um, would make decisions um, based solely upon the law uh, and upon the facts of the case. Yeah? Um, so that's how judges should be uh, making decisions. Uh, their decisions. Now, whether it's the law that they should be taking proactive measures, such as you say, um, I think is a discussion we could have on um, activist judiciary um, or not. I personally am not a fan of activist uh, judiciary. I personally believe that the judges are there to um, apply the law as it is, not as they would wish it to be. Um, and uh, so the rule of law requires that what they do is apply the law as it is, and apply that to the facts of the case, and the outcome leads them wherever the outcome uh, leads them. I don't, I, as I said before, I don't do not accept or believe, even though that is, you know, very much the common law system um, of judges kind of interpreting the law in order to favour a particular outcome. It's pretty much what they do most of the most of the time. I don't support that uh, judicial um, activism or intervention. Uh, I don't believe that should be the role of the judiciary. I get a quick follow-up. Yeah. yeah. But if we assume that they're right, that judges through the normal interpretive process do have to make moral judgments, you know, proximate cause, state action, those involve moral considerations about guilt, responsibility, liability. Uh, how does that, you know, what does that do for your theory of Judges just simply cannot avoid these moral, normative, you know, extra legal judgments. Well, I think we'd need to go into more detail about the kind of things that you're you're referring to, because I'm not entirely convinced that judges do need to do that. Um, uh, for example, if um, there is now, don't forget, in the common law system, the idea is that the person who takes the case has to assert their case uh, in a civil case beyond the balance of probabilities. Yeah? If there simply is no authority, precedent or law for the proposition that's being asserted, the judge says no. Yeah? You don't have a case. Um, and it is for the legislature, whoever that may be, to decide whether that should be corrected or not. Thank you.